This is the final word story time. Your weekendly wander through the hallowed halls of cricket history. My name is Jeff Lemon. With me is Adam Collins. Hello. Uh, don't you look delightful? Hello, Adam. What's uh, what's happening down your end of the line? I've been watching the county championship. That'll that won't surprise you. No, it's it's an away game for middle like six. Like a so hawk. Plug into the streams and away we go. So between that and everything else that we do around the final word, it's been a busy day. <laughs> you you are watching so much cricket now, which is yeah. hilarious because historically, you know, I've usually thought of April as the relatively slow month <laughs> cricket wise. You know, the Australian season's finished. There's a little bit of time to gather breath before all the the mid year tours start um, start up. But no, you've been watching. Mm. You know, you're watching IPL and nine county matches per round and basically kick me across all of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that if Winnie wasn't yet at nursery, so if we were in, say, February and March, this wouldn't have been possible, mm. of course, because it's just a wrangling, constant wrangling act with, a, with an infant. But given she's down the road at nursery for eight or nine hours a day, it does afford me that extra flexibility. So taking advantage of it while we can. Winnie update? Haven't had a Winnie update on the show for a while. Yeah, she talks lots, uh, which is great. She has uh, so many words, and I find it interesting how like these words just... I don't know where she gets them from, but water now. So she goes, water, water, mm-hmm. water. No interest in walking, uh, so... Mm-hmm. Um, no, she, she'll, why would you? She'll pull frankly, us off. Up. Like once you start, once you start walking, people expect you to walk after that. Exactly. <laughs> if you're smart, you put off that bit for as long as possible. Well, I wonder whether she's clocked that as well because she can definitely stand mm. up. She just elects not to walk. So there's that. Mm. What does she like doing? Her favourite hobby or hat? A know. little bit like Stuart Broad, your daughter. <laughs> her hobby at the moment is when we get her ready for bath and bed and all the fun stuff when she's a bit ratty. There's the the spare bedroom. So Jeff, the bedroom that used to be right of mine when, when you were staying with us mm-hmm. um, which has a bed in it and she just loves basically wrestling on there loves getting into her nappy and just being like gently choke slammed onto the pillow and she goes fucking wild for it absolutely loves it so <laughs> just wants to brawl just wants, just to, wants brawl. to brawl yeah just wants to wrestle yeah. the whole time so that's quite fun and oh this is the, I might have mentioned did I mention to you that one of her new words is, is more so when she's breastfeeding and she's still doing it 14 and a half months Rachel's is an absolute champion Winnie will just keep going more more, more, <laughs> when just like trying to gr- grab at Rachel's boobs. So, and it works. <laughs> who, who can fault it as a strategy? Oliver, Oliver. More, more, boy else from more. more. Yeah. Uh, what else? She says she she know, she doesn't know any colours apart from purple. And anytime we walk past anything that's purple, she goes, purple. <laughs> it's very, very <laughs> cute. <laughs> And it's also really handy if, for instance, um, you're being followed by Grimace, uh, you know, say, and and say when he's looking over your shoulder, you can't see behind you. You don't know that Grimace is coming up behind you with a garrot wire, you know, (laughs) ready to ready to feed some more meat into the McDonald's machine. But you get the warning, the early warning system. Either that or or, or, or a Hobart hurricane's coming up from behind me. (laughs) Just a big eggplant emoji is just following (laughs) me down the street. Yeah, but she's loved nursery. She, she's really taken to the uh, to that. They get these little report cards each day, and they're, they're, yeah, they're 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 quite adorable. Um, and yeah, she seems to have really taken to the the socialising. And she's been sick a couple mm. of times. So that's all part of it, as I mentioned last week or the week before. And uh, yeah, great to have her at this stage where she can communicate with us and mm. not just have that one way. She's telling us what she wants. Heaps of fun. And yeah, maybe she'll walk by the time she's three or something. But no no signs of it happening anytime soon. <laughs> they have chairs with wheels on them <laughs> and here I am using my own legs like a sucker uh, you, you've given me a great visual of like dream dinner party style of just purple so like say Grimace having dinner with Barney the dinosaur George Bailey in a Hurricanes <laughs> outfit and just a big eggplant emoji it's the four of them sitting around a table enjoying you know, a, a lovely dinner not eggplant obviously no, no. show let's have a show let's do uh, it. Had, a, had a message from Luke Reynolds because we were talking on the show about the walk on music that players had in one day internationals in the early 2000s and i was recalling that i think from memory about seven of the 11 new zealanders had sandstorm by darud which either meant it was very popular or that they hadn't submitted a song choice <laughs> luke wrote in to to say that he had a memory of it going back slightly earlier luke went to all three games of the year 2000 indoor series against south africa at Ooh, the yeah. then colonial stadium i remember that series did you go as well, well. I don't think I went, but I reckon I I definitely watched all of it on television. Yeah, I, so I, I went to the I went to the first roof. one. Well, yeah, I went to the first one on novelty value. I think we were, I think we were permitted to leave school early. I have some recollection of us mm. telling the school that we were 
going to get the train down to Docklands and watch. And then the second game, which was the Friday night, I think it was a tie. I wasn't yeah. at that because I was watching Hawthorne lose by a couple of goals to North in the first semi final mm-hmm. in the old Ponsford stand. But uh, yeah, that that was it was kind of exciting, wasn't it? That indoor series, the idea that you know this could be a thing that would be done in the future. But little did we know that drop in pitches are shit and and cricket at the Docklands is is fairly underwhelming. And I wish I never did. Yeah. It. But hit the roof, hit the roof. Um, anyway, Luke went. He said the the best of his twenty first birthday presents were tickets to those games, and the walkout music was used in that series. He specifically remembers Shane Warne striding to the crease to "I Can't Get No Satisfaction," <laughs> which is very appropriate. He's in the mural, um, and and <laughs> and Andrew Simons to Midnight Oil's Kosciuszko tune. Um, those are the two that stick in the mind for Luke Reynolds. So thank you, Luke. Outstanding. And I've got a quick reminder before we uh, start the Nerd Pledge component of the show today, and that's from Pete English from the University of Sunshine Coast. So we're working with Pete, who used to work for Crick Info. He was the Australian correspondent for that wonderful website before he went into academia. And at the moment, he's um, doing some some work around podcast audiences in Australia for a publication that he's doing uh, with the University of Sunshine Coast. And as he explains, because there's been a proliferation of podcasts in recent times, there's been very little research done to understand the audiences. So he's designed a 10 to 15 minute survey about the final word, which is pretty cool. So uh, we've had a look at it. It all works nicely. It's all legit. There's a, I think there's a disclaimer at the front, which you need to acknowledge that you're happy for the answers to be used in a public journal, but it's all anonymous and it's all there in the bottom of the show notes. You'll see a link to the University of Sunshine Coast. And thanks to Pete English for his interest in our show. And hopefully, yeah, he can learn a thing or two and we can learn a thing or two about our um, about podcast audiences and specifically uh, those of you who listen to us. I mean, the questions are things like, do you like this podcast? You know, why do you listen to this podcast? Do you play cricket? So if those answers can be used against you in some way, <laughs> you have more problems to worry about than, than that. Like, you've obviously got some things going on in your life that you really should not. The Sam Ashworth Cat Project We have to touch on this. Now, this is a piece of extreme nerdery in which uh, our listener, Sam Ashworth, got in touch and linked us up to a Google Drive folder with an immense array of spreadsheets in it in which information about every single test cricketer who's ever lived has been entered. We decided it would be easiest to speak to Sam briefly to give you an insight into the mind of a madman. Uh, And so we caught up with Sam. Just a minute ago. Sam Ashworth, the man with the commitment to the final word story time cause. How are you? I'm good, thank you, yeah. Thanks for spending a couple of minutes with us off the top to explain what you've been up to deep in the spreadsheets. Can you tell us the story of what we said on story time that inspired you to undertake a significant body of work a couple of months ago? So it all started last summer, I think. As one of you mentioned during the Nerd Pledge that you saw someone had the same cut number as one of the scores. I think one of you said, oh, I wonder what the highest one is. And so then during one of the rain-off sessions in the England-Pakistan series last summer, I thought, oh, I'll have a look through the England ones. I'm not going to invest in my time. I'll go through and end up taking most of the day. I sent to you guys, like, oh, that's really cool. And then this winter I decided to go through and do the rest. So I did every test team, male and female, so, Sam, just so that people have a concept of what you've done here, it's matching up every cap number with someone who's made the same score batting, also matching every cap number with someone who's taken the equivalent figures bowling, yep. every cap number with someone who has the equivalent total number of catches or stumpings for men's and yes. women's cricket for every yes. that's played test cricket. Yeah, so I've looked at the summary page of every single test cricket, male or female, which I imagine there aren't many other people who have done that as well. What are some of the uh, more remarkable findings? Yeah, there are quite a few. So I think for the men's, one of the most impressive is Wally Hammond, uh, who set the record with 227 against New Zealand in 1933, and that's stood the test of time. There's only McCullum, who's come close with 224. Other than that, there is uh, Sheeran Campbell, who's the only double centurion, also against New Zealand. I also found that Jack Callis, who was captain of 27 for South Africa, made it on six separate occasions, which was the highest, num- one of the highest numbers of um, a player making their captain on multiple occasions. Uh, the highest of those was uh, Khalid Mashoud for Bangladesh, who was captain number six, so a very low one. 
but he made it on eight separate occasions, including twice in the same match, which I thought was really cool. You mentioned Wally Hammond. We're going to be talking at length about his venereal disease later in the show today <laughs> as it happens. The Every player page, that takes some dedication. Of course, that runs the risk of having a break in concentration yeah. and getting something wrong. How did you maintain your concentration, presumably through some quite late nights? Was there a was there a method or a process you went through? It was more just like breaking it down and doing it in chunks. Uh, so especially for the men's countries that had a lot of players, I'd only do one of those per day and then I'd give it a few days because it does get a little bit boring. What about what you were fueled by? Were you fueled by caffeine? How are you, how are you pulling this uh, together? Uh, yeah, plenty of caffeine and plenty of uh, very intense techno. Intense techno, intense that's techno. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, we know that Chris Cairns loved Sandstorm and we know that Sam Worth <laughs> loved some banging Detroit Tech at 5am while looking through Wally Hammond's career record. Uh, it's a, a triumphant achievement. Uh, well done. And uh, you, you, you have lived up to exactly the kind of thing that we would hope that our listeners would live up to. And in closing, Sam, before you go, just to be absolutely clear, you're, you're permitting us to share this, aren't you? We're, yeah, absolutely. We're now, we're now allowed to give this information to everybody who's part of the final work. Yeah. Of course. Magnificent work, Sam. Thanks for coming on and having a chat. And uh, anyone else who feels the need to undertake a project like this, well, you can also become the C by Super Performer of the Weekend, <laughs> Jeff. How's that sound? That, that is a gong that we don't hand out easily, you know. We don't, we don't just give these away, but we do once a week. Uh, but only one, only one. There can be only one C bus. Super Performer of the Week is is an extremely important prize. Don't throw away your innings in retirement. That is what they would like you to remember, <laughs> the fine folk at Seabus Super Annuation. You can go to seabussuper.com.au slash the final word. Maybe we'll see if they'll put up a link to Sam's cat project on their landing page as well because you could spend your retirement doing projects like this. Uh, you, you can remember that past performance is not a reliable indicator of future performance and you can find out if the fund is right for you by downloading a PDS from that website. Thank you, Sam, for your service. Your nation salutes you. Uh, there was a suggestion that... Uh, really fanatical listeners to the show should be called Final Nerds, uh, that that should be the, the sort of Good. The supplied. Good, I like that. Um, you know, so I, I'm, a, I'm a final nerd. So that definitely must apply to Sam at least. I'm sure Sam wouldn't have any – take umbrage of that. Yeah, and I know we kind of touched on this at the end there, but if there are other bits of work like that, then we, we might start mm. featuring them on the weekend show for our final nerds. Who's to know? Well, The bar's pretty high though, to be got- fair. We've got one up our sleeve for next week, I'll tell you what. This is the thing. You've, you've, you've spoiled the setup. I've did the setup and everything. It was going to be a surprise alert. next week. But, yes, we, we no, have it. But a, no one knows what it is. We have a new, they don't know how good we it is. We have a new patron who's done some, some crazy stuff. and He doesn't know it yet, but he's on the show next Saturday. All right. Now, let's play a game. The thing that we do, the, the central component of story time is this game, and the game is called Nerd Pledge! Nerd Pledge. It's the game we play with the lovely people on the Patreon page. Uh, they are the reason we have a show. They support the show. They make it happen. They send us uh, contributions, donations, uh, small amounts of currency, occasionally large amounts of currency, mostly small amounts and small amounts are fine. And those small amounts are not in ordinary currency numbers. They're in other numbers, very specific numbers and very specific because they have something to do with cricket. But we don't know what that is. We have to work out what it is. That is the premise of the game Nerd Pledge. Well explained. Uh, have you listened back to any of these recently where you can hear the amplifying effect that DC's put on the Nerd Pledge raw you do at the start? I have not, to be honest. I, I tend not to listen to my own show because that's a bit like drinking my own bathwater. And usually you'll tell me if it's been good or bad. Yeah. I'm like, okay, fine. I, I, I quality assurance it later just for my own. Yeah. Is that even a word? The quality assurance something? Of course yeah, it's not. Yeah, why not? You can make um, it a verb. Yeah, but... Uh, you can make anything a verb. But the, uh, yes, the, there's that extra extra bit of love there from DC, which I've noticed and oh, I nice. certainly appreciate. I also appreciate the first number this week. It came in from Sam Litster. Jeff, and it comes with a clue. Yes, yeah, Sam's number, he says, was inspired by a tour match my grandfather would tell me about, even though he wasn't quite yet born when it was played. The number is 201, which is to say, you know, the number is $2.01. 
So it could mean 201, could mean 2.01, 20.1, 0.201, all kinds of things. Could be two, zero, and one, meaning some different things in different ways. You can interpret a nerd pledge number however your crazy mind wants to do it. But 201 is the number in front of you, Adam. What do you got? I like it when we get a number that we've had before, but that has an entirely different spin on it. And 201 certainly meets that criteria. And sometimes Jeff will flap a bit harder just to get everything out of a number and I felt like this was the perfect opportunity for that. So first of all, we had to work out a bit about Sam to identify a bit about his grandfather, right? And looking Mm -hmm. back through our old messages, I remembered that Sam is from Brisbane. And looking at Mm -hmm. his profile picture, I would say he's about our age. He might be somewhere in the order of five years either side, let's say. He could be somewhere between 31. 30 to 45. Yeah, something like that. I reckon closer to the 31. Mm -hmm than the 45, but he's in that bracket. It's, you can only tell so much from a profile picture. And sure. that meant I had to go through and, of course, look at every tour game where 201 was made. And I did. Uh, I looked at every tour game <laughs> where 201 has ever been made. And I found a couple well, of... Well, also, also, grandparents are notoriously fickle. Like, generation's very fickle. You you can have... You say, if you're a newborn child, you could have a grandparent who is 28, you know, if, if both generations got onto things far earlier than they should have. Or you can have a grandparent who's like 85 when you're born. Like, who knows? You know, yeah, it's uh, like some... that, um, isn't there that thing where one of George Washington's grandchildren is still alive or maybe gra- great-grandchildren or, or something ridiculous like that? So, Yeah, there was a grandchild of a, one, a president around that time, not Washington, but one of the sort of civil, near the Civil War kind yeah. of presidents, yeah. I think. All right, so... If Sam's about our age, it's not Mm -hmm. going to be uh, the 201 that Clive Lloyd made against Glamorgan in 1969, nor is it going to be the 201 that Clive Lloyd made against Glamorgan in 1976. How cool is that? In two separate (laughs) tours. Getting new trick, Clive Lloyd. Getting new, you know, he's doing the same material. Came back for another tour, he's doing the same show. How cool is that? In two separate tours of England against Glamorgan, so at Glamorgan, he made an unbeaten 201, 1969, then then seven years later when he was captain in 1976. It's probably not Bill Woodfull at Essex in in 1926 at Leighton, even though the timings are pretty close for that. I'm going to assume that Sam's grandfather was Australian for the purpose of our exercise. Mm -hmm. And thus, I'm, I'm also going to guess that Dave Norse, when he made 201 for South Africa against South Australia at Adelaide in 1910. That's just a bit too early. Like that's more great grandfather age than than, than grandfather yeah. age. So, and of course, Dave Norse was the, the the true standard bearer for South African cricket around the turn of the century. Played, I think, 45 Test matches, something like that. So, process of elimination. I ruled out many, many, many 201s from across the journey, and then I ruled mm-hmm. one in from Adelaide in 1920. So 10 years after Dave Norse made 201, another man made 201 against South Australia Mm -hmm. at Adelaide Oval, a man by the name of Jack Russell. But not the Jack Russell you're thinking of, of course, who was born many decades later. This was Charles Albert George Russell, also said his birth certificate, known as Jack to his mates. Not the dog. He came in at number three with our old friend Wilfred Rhodes up the other end, and they put on a shitload. They took the touring MCC from 29 for one to 397 for two, a 358 yeah, run stand. Up. Have that. Wilfred Rhodes, 210. Jack Russell, 201. Glorious stuff. So our man Jack hits 23 boundaries along the way. The MCC scores 627, and they win by an innings. But what about this guy's career? It was a superb one, both for his county, Essex, and his country. So I, I mentioned that ground, Leighton, the Leighton County ground where Essex used to play in, in the context of Bill Woodfull a moment ago in 1926. Well, he was born around the corner from it, Jack Russell. He was a, a, a Essex man through and through, a professional, not an amateur. Mm-hmm. Uh, he made 71 first-class hundreds uh, between 1908 and 1930. Of course, he missed five seasons uh, for the war as part of that. He had five 2,000-run seasons along the way. He sort of dominated through the early 19. 19- 20s. And how's this? A few years after he made, uh, he had these five seasons of 2,000 runs. His cousin, Titch Freeman, had, no. five, had five seasons in a row where he took more than 200 wickets. Isn't that nice? So, cousins. Uh, cousin of Titch? Cousin of Titch. Cousin of Titch. So, um, one cousin racks up f- 2,000 runs five times on the bounce, and then uh-huh. the other cousin takes 200 wickets uh, five times in a row a few years later. And there's there's a, a link there because, you know, Titch Freeman, five foot two leg spinner, renowned for being tiny, 
Jack Russell's tiny dog yes. um, <laughs> sharing the same name as this gentleman who may or may not have been big, I don't know. But, um, you know, they, 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 they go together. I've, I've not even got to the best stuff yet either. I know I've been talking about Jack Russell for a while now, but he loved Adelaide. So earlier in that Ashes Tour of 1920-21, which obviously was an ill-fated Ashes Tour for England when they were whitewashed by the big ships team. Obviously. Everybody knows that. Obviously. <laughs> Yeah, maybe obviously. I love the, the way that you said that. Yeah, it was the wrong wrong choice of word. Maybe obvious for you, Jeff, but I think most people who follow this show closely would know what happened in the Ashes series immediately after the war. But Jack mm. made 135 not out on debut at Adelaide Oval against Australia. And then, remarkably, he was dropped a couple of test matches later. Johnny won't hit today's team, uh, lost 5-0, and the bloke that made 135 not out on debut was sitting on the sidelines by the end of the by the end of the series, which reinforces why when he walked out and made 2-0-1, uh, that it, was, it meant a fair bit to him, because by that point he'd been left out of the test team. He only played 10 test matches between that debut in late 1920 and 1923. He hit five centuries and just two other scores above 50. And Jeff, I know you love that kind of conversion rate with more tons than 50. So five centuries, two half centuries. He averaged 57. Unfortunately, though, he only played 18 innings. So by virtue of the qualification Mm. measure that Crick Info used and tends to be the standard that most statisticians go by, he was two away from being eligible, so to speak, for an average. Had he done so, that would be the 13th highest average in the history of Test cricket. And I Mm. reckon I'm leaving the best bit to last. Jack Russell in 1923 in Durban became the first Englishman to hit twin tons. And it happened to be his final test match. So his sign off to test cricket against South Africa was 140 in the first innings at Durban and 111 in the second innings. Unfortunately, not long after that, he got ill and he missed a lot of cricket through the next couple of years. In 1949, well after he retired, he was held in such high esteem that the MCC made him one of the very first professionals to become a playing member of the club. And then he died uh, eventually at age 73 in 1961 at Whips Cross. And that happens to be where another England and Essex stylist, a leg side stylist, which um, Jack Russell was, uh, was born 36 years later, Dan Lawrence. So Dan Lawrence was born where Jack Russell died some 36 years later in 1997. So a nice link back to the modern day for uh, a man who made 201, going back to the very start, at Adelaide Oval in a tour game in 1921 and a tour game that I hope that Sam Litster's grandfather remembered fondly. I hope you did too because otherwise you did a lot of work <laughs> for nothing. Just going back to the last bit though, how about, how about that? Twin tons, the first Englishman ever Outski. to make twin tons. No one ever did it before him. And we know, and then you're out. And then you're out. That was it. <laughs> because he was crook and all the rest of it, but never got another bottle yeah. of cherry. Do you have a sense of how many English players have made twin tons? Because I'm trying to think. Uh, I can't think of that many. I mean, Gooch, obviously. Gooch. Yeah, um, I mean, off the top of my head, nor can I, but I suppose twin tons aren't the sort of thing you clock the way you might do centuries on taboo. But nevertheless, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's been done plenty of times, but the fact that it took until 1923, given the first test match was back in 1877, that's quite the achievement. Mm. So, yeah, and that average, 57, five tons, 250s. He, he obviously was quite a player. And, yeah, I loved, the, I loved that tie back that he was known for his play through the onside, which wasn't that common through that era. In the early stage of Test cricket, you know, you played through the posh side, but yeah. he was a leg side player. And, yeah, the, the fact that he you know, died where another leg side player was born in Dan Lawrence. So, yeah, felt good. Maybe... Maybe it took them that long to get a Twin Tons player because they did things like dropping players two matches after they just made a big hundred (laughs) in series where they were getting flogged. And it was a time when England went through about 400 test cricketers in their first 40 years or so when they were like, anybody who comes from a posh house, sure, you can play. You can bat at nine and don't bowl, you know. No worries. I'm just doing a cheat and I'm looking up who's made Twin Centuries in in a – in a test match because there must be heaps. Um, a couple a couple of Sutcliffs, a Wally Hammond, okay. a Dennis Compton, an Eddie Painter. So, the, you know, the usual suspects. And then nobody for bloody ages and ages and ages, until Gooch, actually. Oh, really? And then Alex Stewart did it. And then Vaughan and Truscothic and Strauss in the modern era. And it looks like that's about it. So there's, there's a big gap between Gooch going all the way back to Compton in 1947. It's interesting that there's been more centuries on debut than there have been twin tons. I would have thought it would be the other way around. I probably uh, mm. told this story on the show before, but I will again, given it's relevant. At the Kingston Cricket Club, which is at Sabina Park over there at Deep Mid Wicket, 
from where you're looking at the press box uh, down at the pitch, there is this wonderful sort of tribute to twin centuries in Test cricket. Every player who's achieved that in Test cricket has a bat on the wall there at the bar because in Jamaican cricket, that's considered to be the greatest possible feat to make centuries mm-hmm. in both innings. That's like, that's God status. You can't do anything more than, than that. So that's mm-hmm. why they celebrate it um, in that cricket club there at Sabina Park. So the next time, Jeff, that we get the chance to travel to the Caribbean, we will go there and we will look up the name of Jack Russell right? and we will take a photo with it. That bat in question. We will. And now we will move on to our next number before it is a triple header. A triple <laughs> header. Three people with the same number, presumably all meaning different things. And if I have a sense of what some of the answers are, uh, which I do because I've done some of the research, they are about different things. And and so we've, we've taken to kind of including – if we've got three people with one number, we used to just do it as one number and then have lots of other numbers on the show, whereas these days <laughs> we know we're going to spend enough time on this number that mm. we'll, we'll treat these as, as, as three separate pledges if you will the number is four dollars fifteen and or four pounds fifteen uh, it comes in from ian minus dave mcrobbie and luke reynolds the first on the list is ian ian sent a clue a cute little clue a sort of cryptic enid blighton sort of clue which said i'd rather be a pear than a bear to which I, I assume then Adam replied, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Well, uh, sort of. So I, I actually wrote back and said, I assume that means you're reflecting on a, a time when Worcestershire has beaten Warwickshire. And then Ian mm-hmm. got back to me and said, I've been a bit too cute with the clue, haven't I? <laughs> he, was, he, was, he wasn't talking about a time when Worcestershire had beaten Warwickshire. More that an important day in the history of Worcestershire County Cricket Club that happened to happen at Edgbaston. So that got me thinking and it didn't take long to realise he was referring to T20 Blast Finals Day in 2018, so only uh, only three years ago. And in the case of Ian, he went on to explain to me that he went that day, he was offered a ticket and said it's one of the most enjoyable days he's ever had uh, watching cricket, which was really cool. So, yeah, they, they overcame Sussex in, in the final, of course, Edgbaston being the home of the Bears, so thus the pair and the bear. They kept Sussex to 147, uh, thanks to Moen Alley's threefer. But what does the 415 mean? Fat Pat Brown took none for 15 from four, which, of course, was match winning, because why wouldn't it be? None for 15 from four in a, in a T20 final. Uh, and then they chased down that comfortably with nine balls to spare. Moen Alley, 41 from 27. Ben Cox, an unbeaten 46. Not a bad effort considering Sussex had a pace trio of Jofra Archer, Chris Jordan and Samal Mills. So three of the best T20 bowlers in the world, really. So they were deserved winners after leading the group Worcestershire, then pumping Lancashire in the semi-final earlier that day. So I am as sure as one can be that that's what Ian Miners is referring to with his 4.15. Pat Brown's none for 15. And the reason I called him Fat Pat Brown is a, a reference to a TV show. It's not a reference to his waistline. Okay, good to know. Was this just after Moen had moved from... Warwickshire to Worcestershire. Well, he's Is that done. A thing that yeah. Well, well, did well, I make that up? It, it, it's it's it's. It was a long time ago that Moen made that move. But you're right. No, Moen did has played for both counties, so uh, he has history with mm. the ground at Edgbaston. Indeed, it's where mm-hmm. he played uh, his most recent home test match uh, in the Ashes of 2019, when unfortunately he sort of imploded during that Australian second innings, and Smith got right on top of him, and Matthew Wade subsequently, and then he lost his spot in the test team. But yes, in 2018, he was the uh, hero with both ball and bat in that blast final. Yep. And Worcestershire and Warwickshire, names that are just too similar for counties that are right next to each other. (laughs) Gloucestershire and Glamorgan all over again. Please rename one. (laughs) P.S. I am not a crank. (laughs) Um, Right. Okay, so that's the 415 for Ian Miners. Uh, The 415 for Dave McRobbie, who is our second most Scottish-sounding patron after Patrick McKeon. Dave McRobbie has, has sent through 415 without any particular guidance. And so it got me thinking, weirdly enough, Adam, about twin centuries in a test match. Oh, good. Something that you just happened to mention earlier. Uh, In March 2009, Philip Hughes started off his test career in Johannesburg, uh, two months past his 20th birthday, fourth ball of the test match, tried to go over the top of the slip cordon against Dale Stain, as you do, got a nick, caught behind for a duck. Not so great, but the second innings he made 75 in quick time and 
relatively important runs given that almost all of the rest of the batting failed in that second innings and so he was pretty much the difference between Australia setting South Africa you know maybe 300 at most which they might have had a chance to chase versus setting them 454 which they didn't so Australia won that first test match and then in the second test of the series and and his second test at Durban he famously makes 115 in the first innings 160 in the second becomes the youngest player ever to make twin centuries in a test Uh, South Africa got a consolation win in the third test. Hughes makes 33 and 32, and so he finished that series with 415 runs, which is the number of the pledge, averaging 69. So I thought that was a, you know, that's a nice number to come out of your first series. And it's well worth pointing out, because I just did a couple of other numbers out of interest, the twin tons get scored, and the 75 in the first test get scored against... Dale Stane, Makaya Antini, Mornay Morkel, Jacques Callas, Paul Harris and JP Dumini. Right. A pretty fucking good bowling attack to take twin tons off, right? And so I thought, I wonder how many wickets those guys took cumulatively over the course of their careers, that bowling attack, 1,575 test wickets across 529 test matches between those bowlers that he just flayed around Durban for a couple of hundreds. Yeah, I remember that line in, in the Earthboy tribute to, to Phil Hughes mm. when he refers to Dale Stane at the peak of his powers Yeah, when he made those twin tons. So, yeah, I'm not surprised to see that that is a, a truly great South African attack. And, um, you know, also when you look at the career that Philip Hughes had, it it was remarkable. He's still the only Australian player to make a one-day 100 on debut. No one's done that before or since. And by the time he was... He was 25 when he died and he had, in first-class cricket, he'd already made 26 first-class hundreds. So... For a bit of perspective, um, some players we've talked about retiring recently um, after long first-class careers, Alex Doolan made 12 first-class tons in his career. Callum Ferguson made 20. Um, Sean Marsh has had a, a late rush at the end of his career and is still going and, and has made 31 of them You know, as he approaches his 40th birthday. And so, yeah, Philip Hughes, 26 of them by the time he was 25 years old. And, you know, there's always the risk that when someone goes early, you can talk them up too much in retrospect – but I think when you look at what he was able to do by such a young age, there was there was so much potential that, um, you know, so many great things that, that could have happened in the future. Yeah, some batsmen just have a knack of reaching three figures and he absolutely had that. I mean, remember that double ton he made for Australia A uh, in 50 over cricket the year before his passing when he was just like irresistible at that particular point in time. And yeah, 26 first class hundreds you know, in that short window of time, assuming that he would have ended up being a cricketer who played international cricket, state cricket, and probably a lot of county cricket as well, given he had a couple of stints, uh, one at Middlesex and, and one at Worcestershire, he, he would have had an opportunity to have, to have really piled on the first class tons. And I remember before he passed away, a friend of mine who I pay a lot of attention to in terms of their thoughts on the game said to me, this Hughes kid's going to make a hundred hundreds. And yeah, it's just awful to, to think that he was cut off at just a quarter of that. So that is the number that I'm going for for Dave, the 4.15 runs made by Philip Hughes in South Africa in 2009. Uh, Luke Reynolds, who wrote to us off the top of the show, is our third pledger on 4.15. And uh, you've got that one, Adam. Yeah, so it, Luke said it's related to his previous pledge, which was all about Dean Jones. And I think it was Dino's cap number, wasn't it, Jeff, from memory? And 324. 324, yeah. which, of course, was the unbeaten score he made for Victoria in a Shield game in, in the in the fabulous summary had him 94-95. So I went to 4.15 and I identified that as the number of innings that Dino played in first-class cricket. So when we did the Dino special, we, we mostly focused on what he achieved for Australia as a a test cricketer and a one-day cricketer. A couple of references to Victoria, but mostly the test stuff. So I just thought it was worth having a quick skip through his first-class career as a whole with 4.15. And what stood out to me looking at the numbers was just how consistent he was. And I didn't perhaps interpret it that way as a kid and certainly didn't feel that he was that kind of player. But he, he almost every season, he averaged in the 50s or the 60s. And that's from sort of 1981, 82, when he taboos, when he starts getting a run on from 82, 83 and 83, 84, where he makes a couple of centuries in both uh, seasons there for Victoria, gets picked in the test team. But that's kind of what he does every year. And he mm. never had a season where he made more than five centuries, but he made five centuries in a season three times. So you get a bit of a feel for that. 
the year he retired from Australian cricket, which in the end was a bit of a, I mean, I think it was a, not a tantrum as such, but he was pissed off that he was dropped from the one day team in South Africa in, in 1994 and said, stuff you, I'm, I'm not eligible to play international cricket anymore. And obviously he was still well and truly good enough to do so. And that was his best year, 94, 95. Yeah. When he was notionally retired and made 1,251 first class runs at 70, including that unbeaten 324. The next year he goes to Derbyshire in 1996 and uh, leads them to their best ever result in the competition, finishing second where he averaged 52 and then even in his last year he made 900 runs for Victoria so he was very consistent making between about 800 and 1000 runs per season so he averaged 52 in 1997-98 and I forgot this bit Jeff but in his very last Sheffield Shield game at the G against Tasmania in March of 1998 he made an unbeaten century in the first innings and even Mm. 100 not out so it was celebrated by all. I remember it was at the time, you know, the bring back Dino stuff was in full flight, knowing that he was, of course, finishing <laughs> up. And then, and this might be appropriate too, I suppose. Uh, he made he was made a duck in the second innings, his, his last innings uh, of professional cricket, his last for Victoria. He was trapped leg before for naught. And that was innings 415 that I expect uh, that Luke was talking about in his pledge. All up, uh, 19,188 runs. 55 centuries, 88 other scores above 50, an average of 52. D.M. Jones. That's the triple header, the 415. Thank you to Dave McRobbie, Ian Miners, and Luke Reynolds. One more new number for the segment this week. It comes from Joe Reinhard, like a Reinhard cowboy. And he's coming in with $4.25. Uh, Joe says... My new pledge relates indirectly to my previous pledge and also has links to the teams playing the current series. And then there's another hyphenated word hint that says pre-debut. Hmm. Okay. So the current series he was talking about was Australia and India. must have been because that, uh, that, that hint came through in December. The previous number was $5.44 and we had to chase this up because we hadn't actually had it confirmed that we'd had a few shots at 544 and we didn't know if we'd got one of them right so we got another clue about what the first one might have been and I managed to crack that that 544 must mean the five wickets for 44 runs taken by the uh, inheritor of the big German disco (laughs) title um, Jason Berendorf Dorf, 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 Dorf at Lord's Deering the World Cup. Sam Ashworth um, listening to his techno at the Jason Bain yeah. Dorf, Dorf, Dorf. <laughs> pounding, pounding techno music. It's 5am. Do you know where your teenager is? So, right. So so the, the, the 5 for 44 must have been that because yep. Jason Berendorf played for Tuggeranong Valley Cricket Club. Am I pronouncing that correctly? You could probably lose a couple of syllables there. Tuggeranong. 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 That'll do. Tuggeranong cr- Valley. Tuggers. Yeah. yeah, because the clue that Joe had given us was um, I played with this person at Tuggeranong Valley and that is where Jason Berendorf played as a junior. Um, and so then I was trying to work out how this relates to uh, the 425. It's got to be a link that's sort of tangentially related to Jason Berendorf. There wasn't anything 425 related to Berendorf that linked to India Berendorf did once play India A in a 50-over game in which he took two for 50, which if you double one number and half the other number, two for 50 is four for 25. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, and then I thought maybe it relates to Nathan Lyon because Tuggeranong Valley Cricket Club is in that Canberra sort of area of clubs where Nathan Lyon played and his second best ever grade cricket score came in first grade against Tuggeranong Valley when Nathan Lyon smashed 77, <laughs> had a good day out, but I couldn't find anything there. Uh, so I, I gave up and asked Adam to help with his Canberra expertise. Yeah, so it does relate to Nathan Lyon and it also does relate to Jason Berendorf because it's a very sort of Canberra answer. And I'm going to tie it all together via Mark Higgs, who uh, it was another Canberra Comet, made his way through the Queanbeyan Cricket Club, which is technically in New South Wales, but plays in the ACT mm-hmm. district competition. You may recall Call Jeff that back in the 1999 Champions Trophy, before it was called the Champions Trophy, it was called the ICC Knockout, I think, mm. something like that, um, in Kenya. Mark Higgs was called up from absolutely nowhere to be Shane Warne's replacement when he got injured. 
in the end, he didn't play and didn't get that cap, but he was briefly part of an Australian squad. At a very young age, he would have been all of 22 or 23. He was a, a left-arm orthodox spinner, but a, an all-rounder. Press fast forward a few years, and, and by that point, um, he'd left New South Wales and, and moved to South Australia, where he claimed his best first-class figures, which were four for 25, against New South Wales in 2002. And it really was a match-winning performance. So it's a superstar New South Wales lineup. They're chasing 283 on the final day, and they fall 27 runs short because Higgs runs a mark in the final session. He skittles Michael Bevan on, on 114 to change everything, and then he races through the lower order and they win by 27 runs. He made 70 earlier in the match as well for his new state. And where does this relate to uh, to Canberra cricket and Nathan Lyon specifically? Well, Mark Higgs was running the Canberra Comets when Nathan was coming through the ranks playing as their off-spinner in the, what was at that stage called, the Cricket Australia Cup, I think, Jeff. It was the ACT mm-hmm. plus all the other states, second 11s. And he was, yeah, he was the development coach, I think, when Nathan was coming through and, of course... Higgs was a spinner, Nathan Lyon was a spinner. I remember sitting around a bar one night with Nath and Higgs as well after they just won a game in that Cricket Australia Cup and and the two of them were close. So for Higgs' part, he made three centuries in 38 first-class games and averaged 56 with the ball. He had a much better record as a white ball player. Indeed, he's probably like a generation too early for T20. Had he been around now, he would have been quite a useful player in the Big Bash, but that wasn't quite to be. But he is one of uh, ACT Cricket's favourite sons. He did take four for 25 in that Shield game in 2002. And much like Jason Berendorf and Nathan Lyon, he is from Canberra. So that's where I reckon Joe Reinhart was at. All right. That is Nerd Pledge. If you want to play the game, you can do it very easily. Go to patron.com slash the final word. Make yourself an account. Choose your number. We will be notified of what that number is. We will put it in the magic spreadsheet and you will arrive on the show as your turn comes around. It's all rather simple, really. And in doing so, you can help us keep making the show week after week. Let's take our customary mid-innings stretch, uh, consider the fine work of the Lord's Taverners, and then we'll be back with the revisits, the correspondence, the numbers we didn't get right, the numbers we did. And we'll, uh, we'll do it all again. Hi, I'm Ian Chappell. You're listening to The Final Word with Adam Collins and Jeff Lemon. Jeff, the Lord's Taverners, we've been uh, in partnership with them for the last year or so and proud to be so. We're going to be having a, a different kind of conversation around what they're up to this summer. But before we get there, they've had a massive day today. They've had a big announcement of a multi-million pound partnership with the ECB where they're basically the upshot is they'll be making um, disability cricket much more widely available. They've got the the super ones and the table cricket versions of the game that they put on to help uh, people with a disability play cricket who are, are unable or find it difficult to play um, conventional styles of cricket. So that's going to be available in every county um, across England and it's a, it's a massive upscaling of what they've been doing. So, yeah, very exciting news for the, uh, the people who can be helped by those programs. Fantastic. We'll have more to say about that in coming weeks, I'm sure. Um, but to begin, Jeff, uh, this all kind of came from a piece of correspondence we received during the week and, and it's turned into a really beautiful thing. So Declan Lawler has been wanting to do a charity run for some time and on account of the fact that he's been listening to what we've been doing on The Final Word, talking about Lord's Tavs, he's like, stuff it. I'm going to raise some money for the Lord's Taverners by running 185 miles across four days, which is the length of the Thames. And he's doing it all to raise money for Lord's Taverners, one of our Final Word community, one of our patrons who says, I want to give something back. And it's all because of the, the conversations we've been having here. Isn't that just a wonderful thing? My understanding is that it is actually the length of the... He's running along the Thames. Yes, that's, the Thames that's path, that's, the that's right. Yes, yes, Rather than just chalking off a random 185 <laughs> miles, he will be going along the Thames and trying to raise some money for the Tavs while doing so. My favourite bit of the correspondence was when Adam replied and said, blimey, you're swimming the length of the Thames. That's a big (laughs) achievement. And I was like, Adam, if you swim the length of the Thames, you will come out with gills and fins and like you will be poisoned. You cannot swim in the Thames. <laughs> like, I've got I reckon. Next yeah, I Thames. reckon old Desi Renford would give it a give it a bash, or maybe Susie Maroney. <laughs> Jim no, Courier. I, I did. I didn't quite. Um, in my haste, I didn't quite capture what he was saying at the start. But now that he, when he elaborated on, I'm like, oh yes, that makes sense. The Thames path is a thing that people do. Still, yeah. 185 miles across four days. I mean, that's more than a marathon each day. And um, the Lord's Tabs have said to us, you know what? 
just pump it up. Tell people in your community to support Declan. And we will. Yeah. It's going to be all in the show notes. There's a, a, a donation page that operates in the usual way. And the fact that his source of inspiration is from this show and, and, and here he is doing something special for the Lord's Tabs, it, I think it's only right that not only you and I, Jeff, but, but uh, as many people as, as, as we can muster um, from this platform, jump on and uh, throw a few bob uh, the way of Declan Lawler and the Lord's Tabs to support him in, in the run that he's going to be undertaking later in the year. So to be clear, the work that the Lord's Taverners do is all around helping people who are living with disability or uh, living in disadvantage situations and mostly to help young people who are in those situations to help them build up social skills, give them a, a sort of social hub where they can go and be with other people, play sport, be included and in doing so try to combat some of the isolation and loneliness that's bitten so much harder over the last year and more of lockdowns and COVID and all of the rest of it. So lordstaverners.org is where you can find all of the information about the various programs they do. And the other thing they'd like you to think about is if you're like Declan and you want to do something to help raise money, you can, you know, rather than just throwing money in yourself, you can decide that you want to go and climb the three peaks or you want to hike from Glencoe to Ben Nevis. You know, you don't have to do it in a deep sea diving suit, uh, but you can if you want. So you can, you can find ways that you might be able to inspire people around you to contribute. Yeah, I, I like the idea of this. So everyone's been locked up for a year. Now people are allowed back outside and, and are able to raise money. So, of course, the idea of having some huge lunch, uh, you know, as we would have in the past with the Lord, that, that's not going to happen in, in reality. So they've got to find other creative ways to raise money. So, yeah, encouraging individuals to go out there and, and undertake projects like Declan Lawleroos and train and, and do it and raise money. And all of that's there at lordstaverners.org slash events slash challenge dash event. It's a bit of a mouthful, but I'll put that in the show notes. And you can see directly there where the money is going towards. So, uh, for example, at the moment, they're gathering funds for a school minibus, which, again, like it's really practical support to those who really do need it. And there'll be a lot more that we have to say about that through the course of the year. So well played, Declan. We're thrilled that you're doing this. We're proud of you from here at The Final Word. And there are many opportunities to get involved with Lord's Taverners this year. And all of those will be in our show notes. Hi, I'm Isha Gua, and you're listening to The Final Word with Adam Collins and Jeff Lemon. This is The Final Word. Story time with Jeff Lemon and Adam Collins. Uh, before we get to the revisits, if this were to be a, a regular segment, we might call it Hit Me With Your Best Shot. It's but exactly it what I thought. Can... I was going to say, why don't we throw Pat Benatar in here? <laughs> I was going to fucking say it. Always I'm glad you were there Pat too. In there. Throw love is a battlefield in at any time, at any time. Uh, yeah, I, I recall once being in some stage of possibly a breakup or maybe a fake breakup, you know, but, you know, having, having one of those days and talking to one of my friends on Messenger and she just sent me the YouTube link to love is a battlefield. That was it. <laughs> that was the reply. And I was like, yes, I will play this nine times. Yes, I will. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm so glad that part of my life is over. <laughs> uh, don't be too sure. You never know. You never know what happens next. You never know what's around the corner. Hey, life's a, life's a mystery. Life is a highway. I'm going to ride it all night long. Jack Quigley. Friend of the show, patron, the the original author of the rewritten version of Paul Kelly's How to Make Gravy starring Steve Smith instead of the general protagonist that ended up in my book. Jack quickly sent us a, a note with a question, which was, I want to know what is the best cricket shot you've ever seen? And we talked a bit about, you know, whether that meant a sort of genre of shot because you can talk about you know, people often talk about the the cover drive played by blah blah or whatever, and and I think my my category for that is is that freakish shot that Meg Lanning plays through gully with a completely straight bat. Like, doesn't cut the ball, mm. just sort of holds a straight bat near the ball, and yet it flies away through gully as if she's just smashed it with a square cut and hits the rope in no time at all but she's placed so many of those that there's not sort of one of those and Jack wanted to know like just one shot where you see the shot played and you think I will never see a better shot than that have you had that moment good question well my instinct when asked for my favorite shot is to think about sort of the Mark War collection if you like mm. especially the, the clip through mid wicket the cover drives he played at Lords in 2001 
maybe popping Daniel Vittori on the roof of the Wacker, just thinking about how, yeah. how hard and you know, how well timed that needed to be. So that, that's where I'm first drawn towards. Maybe uh, Mark War at, at Sabina Park. He played a number of uh, yeah. number of cut shots that went behind point, and again, just absolutely flew to the boundary. That's where I'm drawn towards. I suppose in, in in the modern game, the shot I enjoy the most is Joe Root's punch off the not off the back foot, but off the balls of his feet, where he's able to sort of get on top of the ball and, and smack it through, cover point with complete ease. But yeah, that, that's a good question. The If you're picking one shot, sort of, I mean, mm. there's the Trumper iconography that goes around that one shot. Yep. So I suppose that's more what Jack's looking at, isn't it? It's like... We don't know where the ball went, though, for the Trumper one. <laughs> true, true. That, that That's a good point. But <laughs> We don't know if there was a ball. <laughs> he might have just been having a jump. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the idea of one shot. I suppose there's the Kim Hughes one-handed cover drive, which features on the front of Golden mm-hmm. Boy by Chris Ryan. Now, I think that was from... Uh, the 1980 centenary test, so the second centenary test at Lords, where he made a century in the first yeah. innings, that that stands out as well. But certainly before my time, so I might take that on notice from Jack. But yeah, a few opening thoughts from me there. Yeah, I reckon there are there are genres of shot that when you first see, you know, when you first see scoop shots and the like, they're so crazy that they just astonish everyone. But they start to become routine. You know, you get used to how to play a ramp and how to play a scoop and so on. And then there's maybe like the additions, like the Rishabh Pant forward roll version, you know, where he, he comes across <laughs> and then sort of launches into a, um, a full tumble turn before getting up after hitting the ball. So there's that. I was trying to think of individual shots. So there was one that I remember, I think from the 01 Ashes with Adam Gilchrist when he got a bouncer above his shoulder, above his back shoulder, and he played a – like a forehand smash but with a straight bat. You know, you'll often see that forehand smash with a cross bat. But he, I think the way I thought of it at the time was it's a drive but it's upside down, you know. The, the bat's pointing the wrong way but it's a straight drive that he's just played with the bat coming past his ear and smacked it back down the ground for four. That stands out as a shot that I, I don't think I've ever seen anyone else play that okay. before or since. I think maybe the maybe the Maxwell, just thinking if we're looking at Maxi shots, and there's a lot to choose from, but the 100-metre left-handed six that he hit against India in, in the uh, in the Monica uh, One Day International oh, yeah. late last year. The one that went up onto the balcony at Monica. Yeah, a 100-metre switch hit. It would have, been, um, would have pleased Kevin Peterson, who I saw during the week was advocating that 100-metre mm. sixes get given 12 runs. I don't think he's thought about that <laughs> too closely, but... Um, anyway, poor old KP. Not poor old KP. Fuck me, he's a gazillionaire and does what he wants and says what he wants and yeah. he's held to no accountability whatsoever. So um, not, <laughs> not not poor KP at all. But yeah, that, that maxi shot probably fits into that category for mine. It's very difficult being me in this dressing room. Um, the there, There's also the Maxwell. Do you remember the, the one during the World Cup, the helicopter shot over cover that landed on the boundary cushion for six? Oh, yes, yes. It was... It was maybe it was against the West Indies or Bangladesh. It was it was one of those sort of cameo. It was no, Bangladesh. Against the yeah, Wings. no, it was the Bangladesh yeah. game where where we were all over Usman Khawaja for did Usman run him out torching him? Tor- yeah, yeah that's Us- right. Usman turned down a sharp single in like with like three overs to go. He's like, nah, no sharp runs. <laughs> yeah, and maybe it was ten overs to go. I, I might be I might be um, besmirching him here. So there's that. There's the Douglas Marillia father of the scoop shot yes because that's it's not a conventional scoop or ramp it, if you go and watch it back he stands up straight and holds the bat out in front of him kind of on an angle he doesn't do any of the kneeling or ducking or getting his head out the way and he does it yeah. twice doesn't he or even three times yeah. in that final over i think three times against mcgrath um yeah. because he he knows he knows the length of the ball and he's just keeps playing the same shot and it keeps working and no one's seen it before they don't know what to do so that's up there and then and maybe the contenders for like just best pure shot I've ever seen. There's one that Virat Kohli played in the 2014 Adelaide test when they were chasing in the fourth innings on the fifth day and Nathan Lyon was ragging it the whole day out of the footmarks, just turning it, you know, a metre. And there was one shot where Kohli plays a cover drive. He waited for the turn, waits for the ball to turn into him and then cover drives it against the spin for four. <laughs> um, and you're like, you are fucking kidding me. You know, he's, he was probably 90 by that point and just absolutely in and intent on, on that win. And th- there's that. And then there was, you might remember this one at Port Elizabeth in 2018 in the Sandpaper series where De Villiers made the 100. And there was a shot he played against Hazelwood to a bouncer where he just sort of cut the ball down between second and third slip 
deliberately, just on the bounce. He's like, oh, no, I'll just open the face and just chop that into the ground and split them for four. Yeah, cool, no worries. So they, they might be my two nominations. Yeah, that was an amazing innings to call. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Jack, for giving us that chance to take a breather mid-show. We've got some revisits to come to, Jeff. And uh, the first of those, well, the first two of these are... Um, not normal revisits because not only have we got the answer wrong, but on the weekly show this week, we completely fucked up the number we were meant to be looking at in the first place. Do you want to try and account for this? I, I, I was trying to apologise in the DMs, but mm. I didn't really know how it happened, so it's hard to apologise. What, what do you attribute it to? When, when you say we did this, you're being very... Um, kind in accepting joint responsibility because Always. we did not do this. I did this. <laughs> I don't know how because – so I, we had a double header and that was correct. We did have a double header. Both of these people, both Aranda Jayavikrama and Anna Collins had the same number. That is true. They did not have the number that I put in that they had. They had $5.66 and I put in $4.55. Now, those two numbers are not really anything alike. They both have a five in them, I suppose. They both have a double number in them, but – that's not how it goes. And I actually went to the trouble of looking back through the entire history of Nerd Pledge. Not only has no one got $4.55 coming up, no one has ever submitted $4.55. <laughs> We've never done that number. <laughs> And it's one of an increasingly small um, band of numbers that we've never had. So if you want to put it in, go for it. But I don't know where it came from. I well, have no means of explaining this. <laughs> well, I like the idea that we, like, we've done it now. And in the case of Aranda, mm. not only did we, not only did you, <laughs> it must be said, do the wrong number, you said that he might have misread the spreadsheet when he mm-hmm. was putting his number in. You're like, Absolutely. 455, I reckon you really mean 462. I reckon you've misread it and put the wrong number into Nerd Pledge. Yeah, I was doing full Donald Trump projection at this point. <laughs> I was like, you, you, you've ruined the economy. Um, yeah, I, uh, look, sometimes you're just wrong. And um, and I was definitely wrong. I haven't, I don't think I've done that before as far as I know, but uh, I guess I've processed a lot of Nerd Pledge numbers by now and sometimes you're going to fuck up a couple of them. So we've got the first one here. So the, the first, so what we'll do, Jeff, instead, Instead of revisiting the 455s that were wrong on a number of levels, we'll actually do 566 for Aranda and Anna. How's that sound? Okay. Yeah. Well, we don't have to do it for Aranda because Aranda has taken mercy and basically said it would be unfair for us to have to revisit a new number from Aranda, which I don't think is true, but that's the that's view that we've got from the patron side of things. So Aranda has said, let me tell you what it referred to. He does say this, Jeff got the ground exactly right. <laughs> Askeria Cricket Ground in Candy. Thank you very much. Where Aranda remembers Kumar Sangakara trying and failing to win a match for Trinity College against St Anthony's in the late 90s. But the game I had in mind, says Aranda, was from 1983 when Tom Hogan bowled Australia to victory with second innings figures of 5 for 66. Now, that would be the game, Adam, in which David Hooks made his Test 100. It would, it? yes, which we talked about yeah. last week. There we are, um, when worlds collide. So Aranda says uh, it seems that he went on a rebel tour to South Africa sometime after that match. He did. So I wonder whether he was a horses for courses selection or if he had prospects for a longer career that were dashed by his decision to tour SA. One reason I picked that number was that I was wondering how the lives of the cricketers from different countries who went on rebel tours ended. The sad experiences of some of the West Indians who made the trip are well documented through the film Branded a Rebel and there is a book about it. There is around her. It's called The Unforgiven by Ashley Gray, uh, which has been very well received. Which was the runner-up in the uh, Cricket Writers Club Book of Mm. the Year or commended for it. We had our AGM. Uh, this week for that, and there was another chance to celebrate that publication. Uh, Aranda goes on to say, the English players seem to have been punished through continued selection. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I've heard that Sri Lanka lost some great players from the 82-3 Rebel Tour as they all got lifetime bans, but it would be interesting to know the fate of the Australian and Sri Lankan cricketers who made those trips and and whether there's more information about it. Well, the Australian cricketers, um, nothing really happened to them. Kepler Vessels went and played for South Africa. Trevor Holmes is the chairman of Selectors. Uh, Terry Alderman continued to play for Australia afterwards. Uh, who else? Steve Rickson was around the coaching setup for a long time. Rodney Hogg was a rent a quote for decades in various media outlets. Probably the player who 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 wore it heaviest was uh, was the captain Kim Hughes. 
And that had more to do with the fact that he'd been the Australian captain until 12 months earlier. So there was... Mm. But on the whole, I, I think your assessment's broadly correct, Jeff, that sure, Rebel Tourist is a tag that they all carry, but I don't think they carry it as heavily as some of those who went from England. Although in saying that, as we've gone through in, in a number of Final Word shows, it, it never really was career limiting for the England players either, many of whom are, are still in positions of seniority within cricket even to this day. Yeah. Well, there's a, a almost disproportionate number of senior administrators in England who yeah. are rebel tourists and, you know, who've who've never really paid a, a significant price for that. So, yeah, I, I suppose it's um, a matter of race as much as anything else that the Caribbean situation, you know, perhaps it, it was taken more personally, taken more as as more unforgivable in the Caribbean, whereas in majority white countries, we went, oh, well, shrug your shoulders, business as usual. Uh, so there's a long piece on the Cricket Monthly website, the um, the, the Long Reads Crick Info website, about the, some of the Australian players who contributed to that. Um, so you could give that a Google and, yeah, we'll, we'll have a dig around and send you through some information if we can find some other stuff. Thank you, Aranda, for your patience and for solving that for us for 566. Anna Collins uh, was the other uh, with that number. Uh, amusingly, uh, well, first of all, she was very happy with our answer for 455, which was um, reflecting on the uh, second women's test between England and South Africa at Taunton uh, back in 2003, where Claire Taylor made a century. She was very happy for that to be her pledge, but I said we'd have a look at 566 as well. The other point she made uh, was that when listening to it, she's like, did I actually put in put in 455? Did I have an Anna Forsyth moment and put it in while drunk? And I c- confirmed for her that, no, no, that wasn't the case. It was it was on our, on our shoulders, not hers. Back to it on this number, once more with gusto. Uh, 566 uh, was the cap number of Steve Rhodes. His son, George, you may recall, Jeff, uh, popped up on our video we were doing uh, at the back of the members at Adelaide during the 2017 Ashes Test match. When we were doing a live video at the time, it might have even been 2016, mm. if I recall correctly. We were doing these live videos and he bobbed up in the background and, and revealed to us that he was actually was a professional cricketer and Vish was watching on from the other side of the world and, and brought that to our attention. I'm pretty sure that was Steve Rhodes' son. Anyway, he wore cap 566 in his brief test career. But how about this instead? We have spent a lot of time, Jeff, recently uh, talking about Bradman's amazing run at the back end of the 1934 Ashes series. We haven't ever really talked about his 334, though, I realise. His 334 is, was, will ever be the greatest Australian innings in, in so many respects. Uh, it, it's certainly the, the number that, that uh, alongside 99.94, is the most well-known uh, with respect to Bradman. So it, it was the... It was um, on the Wheat Bix ad. It was on the Wheat Bix ad, exactly right. It was the, that was that was the finish him off, Harold. Yes, uh, and and it was the you know the the, the innings where he made three hundred and nine uh, in the first day, which which came up when we were going through the Wisden Almanac on the weekly show. So first things mm-hmm. first, Jeff, three hundred and nine on day one. Australia were four hundred and fifty eight for three overnight, which happens to be sixty seven point four six percent of the runs. Now it's no Bannerman, but. It's, uh, it's just above the 67.35, which I thought you would quite like. I do. On that particular point, Mel Shawley sent us this amazing photo during the week uh, that she picked up off Twitter, where in 1930, before they jump on the ship to England, where Don does have an audience uh, with Bannerman. Uh, the SCG. So before he, he took off on the ship, they met. So, of course, Bannerman, the man who made the first Test 100, faced the first Test delivery. He did meet Don Bradman before he went off and uh, had that remarkable tour of England in, in 1930. So thanks to Mel for sending that through. He ended up finishing with 334 on the second day out of 556, 46 boundaries. The next best score in the innings was Bill Woodfull, the opener, who made an even 50. So Bradman came in at 60.8%. Again, huge percentage of the runs in that completed innings. In reply, Wally Hammond top scored with 113 for England. Uh, another sort of amusing uh, find this week was Shield Berry, who decided to talk about uh, Wally Hammond's venereal disease that he picked up on the 1925-26 tour of the West Indies before returning in 1927 and smashing 1,000 runs before the end of May. And that's relevant to this because that's what Bradman was doing in 1930. Uh, he made 1,000 runs before what, the end of May. getting venereal disease? No, he made 1,000 <laughs> runs before the end of May. Oh. And, he, and he was the only man to do it twice. 
Now that's bad luck. That's bad management, not bad luck. He was the only man to do it twice. In 1930... <laughs> you can get it any old how. Matter of fact, I I've got, got it, it now. now. Um, VD. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> uh, get it together, Adam. Get the train back on the tracks. Only one man has made a 1,000 runs before the end of May twice, and that was Bradman, 1930 and 1938. So in the second innings, Clary takes Pfeiffer, but England get the draw. Worth noting in the 1930 Ashes, England did win the first test. And, of course, Australia win the second at Lords with Bradman's 254, which David Frith and others uh, say is the greatest of the Bradman innings. So they were one all when they went to Leeds and Bradman makes his 334. Then there's another draw in the fourth test match at Manchester. So when they go to the Oval, it's all to play for. England, of course, won emphatically in 28-29. So Australia needed to win that test match and they duly did. England dropped the captain. You were talking before, Jeff, about the weird and wonderful ways of England selection in the first 50, 50 or so years of test cricket. Well, Percy Chapman was dumped before the decider and replaced by Bob White but it made no difference because Australia made 695 our Don Bradman 232 they win by an innings he finishes the series with 974 runs in mm. seven innings at 139 with the four centuries and no scores above 50 the perfect conversion rate and the most memorable of them all uh, yes was out of 566 at Leeds thank you Adam can we just come back to venereal disease for a second? Uh, I don't know if you picked up on this the other night during the Royal Challengers match in the IPL. Dan Christian was bowling. A uh, ball was played out to deep backward square leg. Yes. A diving save on the boundary. The bowler applauds the effort, as, as is often the case. And I, I can't recall who was on commentary at the time, but the, the standalone commentary line was, Dan Christian with the clap. <laughs> so, <laughs> really? <laughs> This is, was that in um, the same? It was in the same game, wasn't it? Where he was wearing an ice pack on his head, and the next ball took a catch in the outfield. Yes, and I managed to save that audio, and I thought I would <laughs> share that with our listeners now, in case they missed it. Taken, good running catch by Dan Christian, who was icing his nut a couple of minutes ago, and Harshal Patel strikes again. The ice helped. Dan Christian icing his nut after Dan Christian. Icing his nut after Dan just Christian. a minute ago. <laughs> so he's got the clap and then he's icing his nut. I suppose the two icing. things do could possibly relate to each could. other. They're not not strictly speaking, you know, it's not usually a testicular condition, but you know, I suppose just in the region an ice pack might might not hurt. There is uh, uh, as they they report a burning sensation. Uh, you know, I I can't bring you that information firsthand, as it were. Anyway, we we have other numbers to do, don't we? Deep breath. We took a long time there on five sixty six. Uh, let's come to another number that we've had floating around for a while here, Jeff. It's the two fifty eight from Abilash Shing, and this is the dropped catch thing. You're having what go for at this? I think fourth and final. And um, the good news is you've worked it out. And I've intentionally avoided reading what you've written here. I want to hear it firsthand. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> this is this was quite something. So you know, Avalash had originally said try to hit a catch to this fielder if you want to get your highest score, which you know we we agreed with Avalash eventually meant that uh, this was a fielder who had dropped a number of players who went on to make their highest score. And because I didn't sort of have an inkling of this in my head. I had to make a spreadsheet of the highest scores of everybody in the history of Test cricket, which thinking about it, I could have used Sam Ash- Ashworth's cap project sheet and just copied the that column, extracted that data and, and put it in another sheet. But then you've got to you've got to take out the asterisks for the not out scores so that you can sort the data properly. Then you've got to sort the data from highest to lowest for every single highest score that anyone's ever made and then find enough of them that were made against the same team in approximately the same era that there could be a a player consistent to all three of those things. And so what immediately stood out was uh, a few big scores that had been made against India in the last 10 to 15 years. So in Wellington in 2014, Ishant Sharma drops Brendan McCullum on 34 and Brendan McCullum goes on to score 302. Seems like a pretty good first entry. Two years earlier, Ishant Sharma had dropped Michael Clark at the SCG. 
who admittedly was on 185 at the time, <laughs> but did go on to score 329 not out. So, you know, cashed in. The two from two, I thought, all right, this is this has pretty much got to be it. There must be another one. And so I was looking around for information on a third dropped catch, and I kept finding these mentions that in 2011, Ishant Sharma was in the team uh, against which Alistair Cook scored his 294 at Edgebaston. And there were a range of mentions to Ishant Sharma dropping Alistair Cook in that innings. So that was the third one. So he's dropped Cook, who's gone on to 294, McCullum, who's gone on to 302, and Clark, who's gone on to 329. And that's the answer to the question, except I don't think that he actually dropped Alistair Cook. I think this is a cricket urban myth. I don't think it happened. Because Do you think it relates to the fact that Alistair Cook's one test wicket three years later was Ishant Sharma and it's one yeah, of those things that's been written that. in? Maybe it's been, it's been crossed over because Ishant Sharma was playing in that test match. He bowled to Alistair Cook in right. that test match. But I'd already found – I'd gone back through the innings and found the scores on which the um, McCullum and Clark were dropped and so I wanted to do the same for Cook. I went back and looked at the ball-by-ball -ball commentary on Crick Info of course you and – there's no mention of it, right? <laughs> nothing, nothing, no mention. So this, I thought this was odd and I started searching around online and I could find a lot of second-hand accounts saying Ishant Sharma dropped these three players but I couldn't find any contemporary accounts of the actual match that mentioned a dropped catch. So I started looking more closely and if you want to know if I looked at all 545 deliveries that Alistair Cook faced in that test <laughs> match, yes, I did. I read the summary of all of them. There was no mention of a dropped catch. Um, he was out caught eventually for 294. He didn't even face Ishant that much early on. And so the the reports that I'd, I'd read, some reports saying that he dropped all of these players when their scores were less than 10, which is not true because McCullum was on 34 and Clark was on 185. He didn't bowl to Cook that much early in the innings. He didn't open the bowling. Cook was on five when Ishant first bowled to him and immediately hit two boundaries to go to 13. So he certainly wasn't in single figures when he was supposedly dropped. And there was no, no reference to half chances or anything that might have gone to hand or anything flashed through the gully or whatever it was. There was nothing whatsoever that seemed like it pointed to that. And the only thing that I could find that was relevant to it was a line in a match report from our erstwhile colleague Stephen Brinkley about Cook's innings, which read, this was not a batting strip of the shirt front variety, but although Cook might have played and missed a time or two, he did not offer a chance. Mm. So Abolash Singh, I have solved your clue, but I also believe that maybe it didn't happen at all. It's not in any highlights packages. I looked through every highlights thing I could find of Cook's innings. <laughs> they were pretty short, but there were no drop catches in there. And maybe it didn't happen at all. I mean, extraordinary work on your part, dedication to the cause. <laughs> if anyone's out there wanting to give a clue like that for Abby Lashing, don't do it. <laughs> be my bit of advice. <laughs> Jeff can work these things out occasionally, but it does mean that as a consequence, he doesn't do other things. And, you know, it's all about balance <laughs> in life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. What a time it's been with 258. Thank you. We're there. It's over. Good job. Oh, I, sh I should probably um, actually mention why it's 258. Shouldn't His I? cap number, in it? Yeah. It's Ishant Sharma's cap number. Of course it is. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> it's the most right. straightforward way to get to an answer. Oh. It's like... The <laughs> it's just big Ishant Sharma. That's oh, all it is. God. Big boy. Yep. Next revisit, we move on, is 609 uh, from Sam Nemza. Now... With 609, we talked about a number of 6 for 9s. Nice. And a couple of 609s in some board draws and James Foster's cap. Mm -hmm. Sam was excited to hear the pledge. And even though he now lives in Chelmsford, it's not his home county. So it's not a reference to, to Foster, who, of course, was the Essex wicketkeeper for such a long time. His clue to me was to look back at previous pledges of his and, and see there was a bit of a pattern where he looked at players from his home county who went on to to make big double tons as their first century for England. So Rob Key, 221, and Zach Crawley, 267. So it was honouring their maiden test century for Kent, for Kent players. And he said that I, I needed to be... It, it wasn't this. Uh, the clue was that I was looking for three separate categories for a player on the stats page, two which are relatively conventional and one which is very much not conventional. So 
I'm showing my workings here. So Crawley, Key, Maiden Tons, Kent, Tick. Who's mm-hmm. a Kent player who's played for England more recently than that or in that same sort of modern time? Joe Denley, honest Joe Denley, um, who Jeff, Diamond Joe. Would Denley. you know he has played for twenty four teams according to his Crick Info page. This boy has been mm. around. Originally got the call up for England after a barnstorming white ball season with Kent uh, back in two thousand and eight. Played some T twenties for England. Played some one day internationals. Averaged thirty odd. Played against Australia. Played against Ireland. Played against South Africa. And then he was out again. In fact, he's probably most well known for picking up Graham Smith with his first ball in in T20 international cricket and by the soccer tackle gone wrong from O.A. Shah who took him out in a practice session in those um, games they play warming up before an international day uh, which meant that he did his knee and had to miss a bunch of cricket and the irony there of course was that Denley himself was uh, signed by Charlton Athletic as as a younger man and ended up selecting cricket. Anyway, so that's where his run in the international arena ends in his early 20s. He was out as soon as he was in. He makes a strategic move to Middlesex in 2011 to be, I suppose, on on Broadway a bit more than he might be down in Canterbury, but that was a misadventure. He went back to Kent again, and he was drifting, drifting past his 30th birthday, and you're thinking, well, you know, Joe Denley, still very much a a dependable county player, but nowhere near it as far Mm -hmm. as England selection, and then he cut sick, has an incredible run in 2017 and 2018 across the formats. Um, he's named the PCA Player of the Year. You know, there was a time then when, when Rob Key was captain and he wouldn't bowl Denley. He didn't think he was much of a bowler, more that he just thought that Denley got bored in the field. Well, now he was getting a bowl and, 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 and he was an all-round option, which leads towards Ed Smith, his former teammate, saying, we, we want you um, to come in and, and perform a role for us with principally bat, but maybe ball as well. Um, he goes to the Caribbean in, uh, I suppose it was late 2018, early 2019, uh, at age 32, and, and gets his test debut, makes 69 uh, on debut, uh, enough to stay in the test team. He doesn't quite make the World Cup squad, but he comes pretty close, plays some white ball games in and around that year of 2019. Of course, Jeff, he was cl- made that clutch half century in the Headingley chase, fell six runs short of a maiden test ton at the Oval. Um, press fast forward to the end of 2019 and the start of 2020 and the dentry starts becoming a thing. So the equivalent of the cow and tunny, he was absorbing 100 balls innings after innings, but just unable to mm-hmm. uh, move from, from a half century to a tunny. Never made a test 100 before he was dropped uh, after the first test match against the West Indies last summer, which in a way became a bit of a referendum on his career, which was a fraction unfortunate. Ultimately, he was replaced by his his teammate um, down at Kent, Zach Crawley. I remember he nicked off and it was over. So what does that have to do with 609? Well, he played 15 test matches, made 847 runs at 30, and I'm looking for three separate columns, 650s, zero tons, and nine years between England caps. Joe Denley, 609. What do you reckon? That is bloody good. Like that's a, yeah, that's an answer. That's a solution. <laughs> that's because yeah, you've got to have one outside the box bit, and that's you know yeah. I could have looked at his profile and seen six and naught, but I wouldn't have worked out the nine. Beautiful stuff. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. We've got another one we're revisiting, which was um, maybe wrongly put into the spreadsheet. Oh, Hard to know for just, sure. Maybe possibly salt. Salt in the wound here. Maybe possibly. Salt in the wound. I don't, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Joseph Brookshaw changed his number. His number that we went through last week was a very generous mm-hmm. 1884. We needed to look for mm-hmm. an 18 and an 84 mm-hmm. that weren't necessarily one thing, but the two were related to each other. However, I looked at his profile during the week and Joseph Brookshaw's pledge is actually 1887, not 1884, which completely undermines uh, everything that you were looking at last week, Jeff which we won't go through again now. But um, the other clue that Joseph it's, gave us it's was... Never, it's, it's never been 1884. It's always been 1887. This is, <laughs> I just, I, I just want to say this doesn't normally happen to me. This has never happened to me before. Um, like maybe it's, maybe it's an age thing. Maybe when you, you know, you're getting into the later half of your 30s, like maybe just a few too many late nights, <laughs> a few too many... But this doesn't normally happen to me. I'll be... If we could just wait... A minute. If we could just wait a week and try again, I think it'll be fine. (laughs) All right. So Joseph, last time around, steered us towards two Steve Harmison facts. I think it was 7-12 for a 7 for 12, of course, Harmison's Mm. figures against the West Indies back in 2004. So 
the decimal point separates two unrelated-ish numbers Mm -hmm. but relate to the same player. Mm -hmm. And he added in his second clue, Joseph, that the player's a bowler from the first decade of this century. And I got there pretty much straight away in the end, at least for the first half of it. 18? What does 18 mean? A bowler from the first half of the century, kind of sort of related to Stephen Harmison? I'll give you Simon Jones. And the other clue, by the way, he's not English. Well, nor is Simon Jones. Simon Jones is Welsh. Uh, and he played 18 test matches for England in the first decade of this century. And there was another little sidebar here saying that he's still involved in the game. And he is. So Simon Jones, Jeff, was coaching for a while, but more recently has taken up a role with an insurance company safeguarding against injury inside cricket, which of course was something that he had a terrible experience with, certainly after the 2005 Ashes, where a lot of his career was wiped out through injury and never played Mm. for England again. So yeah, after being involved at the PCA and as a coach, he's now found his niche, I suppose, inside cricket as a former player. And yes, the link back to 18 also is with the 2005 Ashes, where Jones took 18 wickets at an average of 21 in just four test matches, where he was utterly brilliant and sadly never played for England again. So the 18's dealt with, I'm sure, I'm sure, at Simon Jones. Yeah. But what about the 87? I haven't got a clue. Yes, you uh, you asked for my help with this one. And in the end, it's elegantly simple. Uh, 18, 18 test matches, as you say, 18 wickets in the 2005 Ashes, thus playing a key part in helping England win the Ashes for the first time since 1987. Oh, yes. Yes, Jeff. Well done. Thank you, Joseph Brookshaw. Thank you, Jeff Lemon. Thank you, Simon Jones. That's really good. Our last revisit for today is Mm -hmm. Simon Butcher. I told the story of a dusty old bastard by the name of Arthur Wood who played his first test match at the age of 39. Simon enjoyed hearing it when having his morning coffee last Saturday. He was pleasantly surprised to hear his number come up. He was even more delighted when 304 produced a brilliant, dusty old bastard. Arthur Wood sounded like a lovely man, but alas, Arthur Wood was not who I was thinking of with 304. I'll give you a clue. One word, knee. His clue was knee. I went back to him and Mm. said, Matthew Elliott, I've looked everything that could possibly be related to Matthew Elliott in 304. (laughs) And he said, lol, no. Okay, (laughs) I'll give you a clue. I say that this knee upset Graham Smith, to which I had a quick look around Graham Smith's career and he fractured a knee to end his professional career in Mm -hmm. in 2014. So he stopped Mm -hmm. playing for South Africa was, I think, two years through a deal with Surrey and had to retire at age 33. So that's where the knee comes in. In terms of 304, I mean, he made 304 in a series back in 2007 against Bangladesh and averaged 30.4 in Test cricket in 2009, which happened to be his uh, his leanest year for the Proteas. But mm. uh, no, none of them are right. And Jeff, uh, you took it from there. Didn't feel right. No, yeah, no. Adam was on the phone to me going, what's it? What's Graham Smith, his buddy knee, and what did he do with a knee, and who had a knee? Well, not about Graham Smith's knee to begin with. So it is about a different player, and if looking for 304s that connected to this other player, this was a player who did take a five-wicket haul while bowling out an Australian Invitational 11 for 304 back in 2013. That's mm-hmm. not the link. This is a player who once took two wickets in an over while ultimately being unable to defend 304 <laughs> in a one-day match in 2015. Okay, That's not it either. Uh, this is a player who once batted out a night watchman innings of 286 minutes for England, uh, which was second only for England to the 304 minutes batted by a wicketkeeper with a familiar name, Jack Russell. Oh. The other Jack Russell. Uh, who had a knee that upset Graham Smith? It was Stephen Finn who kept knocking the stumps over with his knee while coming into bowl <laughs> to Graham Smith <laughs> and most directly played 36 test matches, took 125 wickets and they came at an average of 30.4, which is the number for Simon Butcher. Bloody hell, what a great way to finish it. Stephen Finn is playing today down at Taunton. Woodstock's own Stephen Finn. We're friends Mm -hmm. of Woodstock. Stephen Finn is using a Woodstock bat this week in his second game of the season. Thank you, Simon. I'm sorry I didn't get there, but much better for Jeff's presence. And I still think that's fucked that they changed the uh, playing conditions that when you knock the bale, 
that it's given as a no ball. I, I, I still think that mm. was. I mean, because that was in 2012 when Smith was shitty about that, and Finn was never better. He was never quicker than in 2012. Certainly, when he returned to the Test ranks in the second half of the summer, mm. he was irresistible. And then they got in his head, didn't they? That idea about where he was running in next to the stumps and with that gangly mm. kind of action. And he had other big days for England, but I don't think he was ever quicker than 2012. And the relationship between that and and knocking the bail off, and I, that never sat easy with me. But he still, he was a fantastic cricketer for England, and uh, still a very effective one for Middlesex, where he's uh, the white ball captain, and yeah, playing red ball cricket this week. There we are. That's the knee. Those are the revisits. Uh, a quick race through the confirmations, the ones that we got right. Uh, Richard Casamento, Il Duce's two seventeen was indeed the dusty old bastard Arthur Conningham and his son, the Air Admiral Arthur Connington. Was that Sir was that Arthur Conningham. <laughs> Sir. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> One of the few people who maybe actually deserved a knighthood in that choice. Yes. Jeremy Burke pulled out the Bannerman twist uh, in which he, he dug up some stuff according to a, a book called Australian Cricket, The Game and the Players, saying that Conningham, once playing for a team called Stanley against Albert in the H. and Ale Trophy in Queensland in 1891, <laughs> scored 26 out of 26, apparently all out, <laughs> no scorecard available. So uh, maybe not just a Bannerman, but a Diamond Bannerman. His scoring shots were 6, 4, 5, 5, 3, 2, 1. So he did it with every possible scoring <laughs> result of 6 and under. No 7s in there, I will note. You can get 7s and, and above. They're, they're technically, I had this conversation with Daniel Nilcross on the live stream the other week where he said he refuses to use maximum for 6, not because he hates new things but because it's not true he's like there is no maximum you can score infinity runs in cricket if they don't return the ball and you can keep running well as, 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 as i probably talked about before if i were doing a neighbor's nerd pledge when dr carl's team mm. uh beat joey mangle's team it was with a with a seven it was a, a mm. seven off the last ball and they ran three and four overthrows and carl kennedy was victorious so you know got to be uh <laughs> Authentic to what happens in the uh, in the games on Ramsey Street. Thank you, Richard, for going full circle on that. Still, st- still the greatest moment. I know we've said this before, but in the history of the OBO, um, the Guardians over by over coverage, when there was a, a long rain delay and Russell Jackson was doing the blogging, and he eventually got so bored he started watching other channels and blogging other channels, and there happened to be a mid afternoon repeat of the Neighbours episode with the cricket match in it, so he started doing an OBO of the Neighbours cricket match during a. T- Test match. Just superb work. Doesn't get much better than that on the OBO. A rainy day on the blog. Yes, Arthur Conningham. I, I, I had an errant R in there. I think I called him Conningham last week, but um, I was pulled up on that. And yes, Jeremy Burke, the diamond bannerman. Uh, we've said before that uh, Conningham Senior was an ideas man. I mean, he must have set that up to be all out 26 and get all of them. He had a bet on it, I reckon. <laughs> I don't think it's, uh, it's uh, going to get me in trouble to say that he would have fixed a match or two uh, 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 over the years. He was clearly not a well man, but produced a, a very, uh, very impressive son. Thank you, Richard. Next up, Alex Crampton. Alex was 297. Uh, Jeff, you looked at uh, Ian Bell's average before the 2005 Ashes. Unsurprisingly, you hit the nail on the head, Alex said. When I was setting this one, I did have an attempt to work out whether Bell had the record for this. And while I couldn't find any sort of instantaneous average list, shock, (laughs) uh, the best I did find uh, was Lawrence Rowe at 214, 100 not out, and 22. So he hit the heady heights of 336 as a batting average before crashing back down to the mortal level of Bradman, Gansholm and Patterson. Mm. Well, what I can tell you, if you're wondering about this, because I have actually looked at uh, adjacent areas to this before, is that Lawrence, Lawrence Rowe has the highest average ever after a completed innings in that after his second innings, he was 316, I think. And then during his third innings, the live average got out to 336 before he got out. No one's had a a higher average after a completed innings than that. And I have looked at the first sort of the couple of contenders on that list because Tip Foster made 287 in his first innings. And then I think 19 in his second inning. So he would have got got up to 306 with a live average before he got out. And then um, who I can't remember who's coming in at number three for the 
Uh, it's Bell himself because Bell's on 297 and then makes six against Australia, thus goes to 303 on mm. a live average before he's out. So it's not either of those two. Uh, so unless there's someone out there who made something like, you know, 160 and then 180 or something like that, there's nothing else that, that could really fit the bill. So I and, think, I suspect, and I suspect we'd know about it. And after the work he's done... I think Lawrence done, Rose got it. Yeah, I yeah. think Lawrence Rose is clear. Uh, Jeff, the next one that... You got right. It was John McFeet in 163. Yeah, David Hook's first ton for South Australia. Uh, John says, I can't express how exciting it was to a seven-year-old just getting into cricket to have a young South Australian score five centuries in six innings at a time when there was a bit of Sheffield Shield cricket on TV and then he was selected for the centenary test, hit the five fours from Tony Gregg, although it doesn't seem such a big deal in the days of T20 cricket. I was devastated when he signed for World Series, not because of any deep moral loyalty, but because we lived in Adelaide and we could receive Channel 2, but not Channel 9. <laughs> Lovely work, John McPhee. 276, Michael Holden. We eventually uh, said that it was Joe Scuderi's economy rate, because that's what we do on this show. We talk about Joe Scuderi's economy <laughs> rate. Uh, Michael said, well done, Jeff, for correctly guessing my pledge at 276. It was indeed Italy's greatest ever cricketer, Joe Scuderi. He's now updated his pledge, so thank you, Michael Holden. Um, Matt Gaynor, the $3.55, uh, £3. was indeed Ravi Bapara's total career runs versus the West Indies. Matt says, I'm not entirely sure if I should thank you for getting my Ravi Bapara pledge as it led me to looking up One Nation politics in Australia and now I need a shower. Ravi's three centuries in three innings is unique. No one else in test history has achieved this as in a century every time they batted against an opponent, I assume, is what they haven't achieved. Conclusive proof that he is the greatest cricketer. I know some people like averages, but I think this is just a statistical backwater promoted by Frank Ward to big up his mate Bradman. <laughs> Too right, Frank bloody Ward. Ravi could potentially have gone 400s from four innings but was dropped for the next match when three of the England top six scored centuries. Oh. Captain Strauss would claim this was to accommodate an extra bowler, but as Ravinho's test all-rounder status is well established, it seems like a plot to make his future Middlesex teammate Adam Voges look better. Very forward-thinking man, Andrew Strauss. <sighs> Two at a force there from Matt Gaynor. Thanks so much. And thank you to everybody who sent a note through uh, with a confirmation that we got your number right. It's always pleasing to get those uh, messages in the patron DM box. And Jeff, as ever, will finish with a little bit of correspondence. Firstly, a note from a new patron, Ross Davey. He sent this through last Sunday, uh, which was Anzac Day, and it made Ross think of another cricketer dudded by Bradman. Interesting that we were just talking about Frank Ward and, uh, and Clary Grimmett. <laughs> Ross Gregory. Now, Gregory played a couple of test matches in 36-37, but was left out of the 38 tour because Bradman thought he was young enough to get another chance. Of course, that doesn't happen because, tragically, Ross Gregory was the one Australian cricketer to die in World War II, so he never actually got that chance. David Frith wrote a book uh, about Ross Gregory, and uh, it's highly recommended from Ross Davey, so I... No, I've never read that, so I will try and get a hold of it at some stage. Ross also had a great idea for Dara to dream. Uh, he says, you could think about getting together a railways team and try and recreate the original result. This could be made up of retired test cricketers. I'm sure there are plenty in Pakistan who could then totally smash the final word 11 by an innings and 851 <laughs> runs. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great imp – what a great first impression uh, there from Ross Davey. Into the inbox for the first time and goes bang. Yeah, that's a ton on debut as far as um, inbox entries go. That, that's – I love that suggestion. As I replied to Ross by keyboard, if – the team involves actual former test cricketers and, for instance, I have to bowl to them, we're going to lose by more than 800. <laughs> <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> that, that, that would be an honourable victory. Yeah, so, it'd be like yeah. much, much as it was with the centenary test in uh, 1977 and finishing with exactly the same result. If we were representing Derek Ishmael Khan and could arrange to lose by that same margin, well, we, we might, have to, um, might have to get... Old Arthur Cunningham involved <laughs> yeah, back from the grave, yeah. and he'd, he'd he might, make sure it might have a few ideas. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he'd fix it up, <laughs> make it quit on it, <laughs> um, and some absolutely astonishing work done by Thomas Melia. Oh now, yeah, this is we, brilliant. We have been talking um, a fair bit about. Thomas Hearn playing in a first-class match in 1868, because of course we have, and whether 
he made Nort not out and carried his bat, whether he opened the innings uh, and didn't score by the time everyone else got bowled out, even though they made 168, I think, from memory. was that what Yeah, that feels about right. It's in, it's in the mid-100s. It's definitely in the 160s. So Thomas decided to find out. Thomas has put in the yards on this. It just started out having a look in a couple of books and the next thing he knew, this was his life for the next few days. So Thomas tells us that scorecards of that time uh, did not necessarily reflect the batting order or changes in the order as we pointed out last week, but he wanted to know for sure. So in the newspaper archive for the publication of Bell's Life, there is an article that talks a lot about the first day's play, but not much about the second, which is where Thomas Hearn would have been batting. The article does say that Middlesex refused a sub for a player named Payne who had his arm in a sling because Kent had refused to let Hearn retire after keeping in the game so that Bueller, who was late, could play. Now, this is some great 1860s shithousery right here. Bueller rocks up late. Bueller. Uh-huh. Hearn's been keeping wicket but wants to sub out of the game for Bueller. Kent say no, and so then Middlesex refuse a substitute fielder when a Kent player goes down with a busted arm. This is this is some real controversial. Imagine if this was happening in a county match in this round. People would be absolutely into it. So Hearn shouldn't have even been in the game. He was only – he must have been, you know – at the bar with Arthur Cunningham putting on some bets and then they hauled him onto the field. <laughs> so nobody mentioned him carrying the bat, though. The ACS, the uh, the Association of Cricket Statisticians for the Uninitiated, the survey of the season doesn't list him as carrying the bat. And Thomas Melia says, I would assume that one of the above references would have mentioned this feat, so can only conclude he came in lower down the order. Hearn's next engagement was to umpire the gentleman versus players game at Lords a few days later, <laughs> where WG Grace made 134 out of a total of 201, a mere 66.67 percent of the runs. And the postscript on this, Jeff, is that Thomas has successfully litigated this point to the team at Cricket Archive, and I've just opened the link here. Thomas Hearn is now listed in this scorecard. He was listed as number two. Now he's listed as number 11, not out zero. So Thomas has managed to get Cricket Archive to change a scorecard from 1868 (laughs) based on researching something (laughs) that he found out about on Storytime. Isn't that just fucking magnificent? What a wonderful way to win the show. Uh, out just I mean I dipped my lid we started with Sam Ashworth and the work he did we end with Thomas Millias and just reinforces what a bloody bonkers crew we have following this show and, and we love you for it this is you know in White Man Can't Jump where Woody Harrelson has to make a full court bucket um, yes otherwise he loses his car yeah this is that that's <laughs> this is the feeling this is this show has achieved something <laughs> we're in the 45th episode <laughs> That's about 180 hours of story time that we've recorded so far. But we have achieved something uh, via all of the hard work of Thomas Melia. Thank you very much for that. Jeff, inhale, exhale. That's it. That's story time 45 done. We've done a lot there, haven't we? To think about the people we've talked about. Good old Jack Russell and his twin tons in his final test match. Sam Ashworth and his caps. It was Ian Miners talking about Worcestershire and the 415 innings that Dean Jones played at first class level, Jason Berendorf and Mark Higgs and the Lord's Taverners and 566 for fuck's sake. How long did we talk about that for? (laughs) And Anna Collins thinking she might have pulled it out of Forsyth and Steve Rhodes' son and Bradman at Leeds and Abilash Shing and the drop catch that may not have been. James Foster, Boar Draws. Joe Denley, Joseph Brookshaw, 1884 or 1887, who's to know? Let's assume it's 1887 and Simon Jones. And to finish yep. it off, Thomas Melia and the corrected scorecard. We've done good work today, Jeff. We've done good work. If we can correct the record on Thomas Hearn, then maybe we can correct the record on Ishant Sharma. If someone on, <laughs> out there wants to go and find out if Ishant Sharma actually didn't drop a catch... If somebody wants to, if somebody's got the like the Rob Linda style, have got the whole test match on tape, and you want to watch all of it and find out, let us know, and we will we will correct the record. We will salvage Ishant Sharma's reputation. Um, that's it. That's story time. That's the final word. I'm Jeff Lemon. 
the other ones, Adam Collins. The show is on the Bad Producer Podcast Network. It's edited by Dave Collins. No relation. Thanks to CBUS Super. Thanks to the Lord's Taverners. And thank you to everybody on the Patreon page. My God, what a shift you've all put in uh, to get these numbers in and get this show into the monster it has now become. Uh, if you want to play, get on patreon.com slash the final word. What that does is let us spend several days a week now making this show and the other show and then the other shows that we do and we're doing more and more and it's because we can because people are supporting it. So there is a very practical, direct, useful effect that you signing up has. It really means something. It really makes a difference. It really means we can do more things. Um, so if you want to jump in, we would love to have you. All right. You said it all. That's it for now. Have nice weekends, everybody. You look lovely. No, that sounded weird. Don't put that in. So you know what I meant here. I had to go about it, write it out.